I love shame actually because it usually relates to things that we don't want anybody to know about us. If we have shame, we're feeling embarrassed, we're feeling like I can't be seen for this thing, or I'm bad because I did this thing, or I am this thing. And I'm fascinated because in so many healing experiences and retreats and with clients and just in my own path, I find again and again that with shame, the thing that we're so afraid of ever sharing or exposing about ourselves that we hold so much shame about is really the thing that we usually have in common with the most people. Welcome to the Graced Podcast, a space for everyday magic for your everyday life. We do this through rituals, aligning yourself to your soul's purpose, and creating alchemy to heal our mind, body, and spirits so that you can bring in more love and joy, manifest your desires, and believe in your dreams. Listen and watch over at gracedwong.com slash podcast and on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, and all the places you can find me on social media. Now let's dive in to today's episode. Hello, hello, and welcome to The Graced Podcast, where we talk about how we can infuse more everyday magic into your everyday life. Today's guest is Sydney Campos, a psychic energy healer and embodiment facilitator, who is the author of the best-selling book, The Empath Experience, What to Do When You Feel Everything. She is also the founder of the Embodied Ascension Academy, where we do have a special freebie from Sydney called the Soulmatic Sanctuary, which is a two and a half hour retreat offering that is usually a paid experience that includes nervous system healing and stability, intuitive development, somatic attunement, presence practice, and soul embodiment. If you want to hear how to access this two and a half hour retreat from Sydney, listen through to the end of the podcast episode. As mentioned, this is usually a paid experience from Sydney, but she is offering this for free for graced podcast listeners. So details on how to access this offering will be at the end of this episode. Today's episode is centered around Sydney's latest book, I'm Ascending, Now What?, where we talk about the ascension process, how to process and move through difficult emotions like shame, how to befriend your body, and how to move emotions in your body, and so much more insight and wisdom. We are also doing a giveaway of Sydney's book on Instagram, so make sure to head over to Instagram to check out the giveaway details. If you've ever felt alone in the ascension process, this episode is for you. Hi, Sydney. How are you? Hi, Grace. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm here. Yeah, I'm excited to just connect. And it's been a really interesting couple of weeks energetically. So there's a lot integrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us more about that energy you're feeling. For me, it's felt like a lot of intense kind of planetary infusions coming in to Earth from the sun, maybe from other planets and dimensions. And it's really been guiding me to feel a lot of deep, repressed emotional energy. So that's been pretty challenging, but I've been facing it in waves and we got to feel it to heal it. And I'm really committed to facing things as they come up and also learning to have a lot of compassion for ourselves and all that we really hold in these bodies that have so much memory and so much experience and we're designed to not hold on to anything yeah yeah that's so true so commit happens to be one of my words of the year and i find that to be a really interesting word because i think sometimes when people are on this healing journey they feel like they need to show up in a certain way and sometimes we do feel these deep emotions that maybe don't allow us to show up in ways that we're proud of but i think the first step is just showing up what do you think Yeah. I mean, there's other schools of thought that would say like, don't let your emotions take you out and commit and show up no matter what and be on your purpose and commit to what you value and do your work in the world that you're here to do. And and I was a little bit in that energy yesterday. I was like, okay, pep talk, show up, do the things that are really going to be meaningful for me today and show up in my purpose. That's going to feel really good. And today I'm feeling more 
a little bit internal and I'm still showing up for this podcast and it feels good to just to name that showing up as you are, you know, I think the greatest gift we can give ourselves in terms of commitment is for me is to really honor however you're feeling in the moment and really do the best that we can to take care of ourselves, give ourselves what we need, make our needs really clearly articulated to those in our lives that can support us and yeah, and really just be authentic, be real. And especially as healers or teachers, just like taking off any masks of perfectionism or the idea that in order to be a healer or a teacher, I have to have it all figured out. And I only show up when I'm really happy and things are great. And that's not always true. Sometimes we surf really intense waves and it can feel like I'm here with you and I'm present. And there's also some grief and some sadness and some heavier energies that are moving through my body right now. And that's okay. That's a part of being human. And I can just be honest about that. And I think I wish I could see more of that in the world. I feel like people are just waiting for permission to be as they are and to have that modeled more as like a healthy example of being with all parts of ourselves and then really connecting with each other. Yeah, you bring up some really good points. But before we get started into all of that, I wanted to bring up your book because I think you address a lot of what you just mentioned in your book. So your book, I'm Ascending, Now What? And I'd love to hear about your inspiration behind your book and what was the process like? <laughs> Quite honestly, I think what I'm going through right now has to do with the fact that I just recorded the audiobook like last week. So it's a 10 hour audiobook. It's such a long book and it's all about healing trauma. It's about my life. I've lived a pretty awesome life and I've had a lot of experiences and I've gone through a lot of painful traumatic experiences too, as we all do in different ways. Part of my purpose is to tell stories and share lessons and learning about how we heal about how we can transform, about how we can become free. And so, yeah, I mean, I got the download for the book probably, I remember really specifically, actually it was summer 2019 and I got this really loud download from my guides, my intuition, just like, you gotta write this book. It's the Ascension Code originally and it's 12 steps of recovering your true self. And what does that really entail? And I had lived a life up to an extent that walked that path. And then for anyone out there who's like considering writing, <laughs> at least this is how it goes for me, like I'll get the idea for a book and then I plan on writing many books. Like I love to write. I love that form. And I get the idea, but then usually life will really give me some lessons to take me through the path that I want to write about so that I really embody the understanding. So I can't just talk about concepts. I really live it and I want to teach as that example. And ultimately, it's the gift we give ourselves too of really embodying our own wisdom and integrating our deepest soul lessons. And so it's been, it was a long journey of writing the book. It went through many iterations and ultimately my prayer for it is that it can reach people who are ready to really be with themselves in a different way and be in the world in a different way and be in relationships in a different way as more of who they really are with resource and tools and support and hopefully a more clear understanding of how trauma impacts our nervous system and our body and our energy system and how really all of our reality is oriented from our energy basically so I share you know there's lots of other people that say similar things and I think it's so important that no matter what we're saying we're, we're putting our message out there. We're putting our version of our experience out there because it, what I say might resonate with different people than what you say. And you might be saying a similar thing, but your message is going to reach different people who need to hear that same thing. So it's been a long journey and in initiation. And I feel a bit of an energy hangover, honestly, from recording it because it's one thing to write the book. And then when you really speak the words out loud and it's a 400 page book, so it's like going through my whole life. And I didn't know that the audio book was going to be like that. I just thought I do recordings all the time. I have a podcast. I do interviews. I love it. And this was a whole different kind of experience. It was really humbling how challenging it was. And I think that energy goes into the audio, though. I think it will be encoded with that level of depth, healing and awakening. And so, yeah, and it feels really vulnerable too, like to have the stories out in the world. It's coming out very soon and it's vulnerable. It's very revealing. And that's part of the healing too, is like not hiding anything and really being available to just be seen and transparent as an invitation for other people to take off their masks and to feel welcome to show up more as themselves. That's beautiful. 
So earlier you mentioned naming emotions, and I know an emotion that you address quite vividly in your book is shame. And I'm wondering how people can approach healing shame in their own lives, and what was that experience like in your life? Well, it's an ongoing process. <laughs> I think I mentioned that a lot in my book. Like, there's no end. There's really no end. There's no finish line and healing and becoming more of ourselves. There's no end, and we can get, I think, excited about that. Like, wow, I can grow infinitely as long as I'm alive and willing to really live. It's infinite possibility of our expansion and healing, and just not recognizing ourselves as we become more of who we really are. And shame is just, I would say, one of the experiences that. I know really, really well, and it's also one of the most toxic emotions that we have as humans that most people tend to store really deep down in the body. That can catalyze a lot of physical issues, emotional issues. I mean, on all levels, it's just really toxic and really heavy from a frequency standpoint. And it's our biggest block to magnetism and resonating in the way that we're meant to, so that we can attract the kinds of opportunities and situations and relationships that we really want. And so, I have a whole, probably two chapters really on this in my book because I felt like it really deserved that level of attention. Going into what are the different kinds of shame? Where do they come from? As rooted in our core wounds, which most of us share in common, whether it be guilt, betrayal, shame, abandonment is a big one. We have a bit of a language and a structure for understanding trauma and how we actually all have more in common than we think. And I love shame actually because it usually relates to things that we don't want anybody to know about us. If we have shame, we're feeling embarrassed. We're feeling like I can't be seen for this thing, or I'm bad because I did this thing, or I am. This thing, and I'm fascinated because in so many healing experiences and retreats, and with clients, and just in my own path. I find again and again that with shame, the thing that we're so afraid of ever sharing or exposing about ourselves that we hold so much shame about is really the thing that we usually have in common with the most people. And it's like we're all hiding these things that we actually all really deeply share, and is such a strong connection. And so I love to work on healing shame and really just transmuting the energy in groups because we can have so much support. The anecdote is really a safe space where you feel welcome to reveal what. Whatever it is that you're hiding, and that can happen with yourself too. I go through a lot of practices in my book about ways to do that, just revealing to yourself, like unburdening to yourself, like anything that you feel that's really heavy that you're holding on to. That good question to ask yourself is: Is there anything that I'm really harboring within, or I'm hiding, and I'm putting a lot of energy into hiding it or repressing it because I'm really afraid if anybody knew this about me, my life would be over, my reputation would be destroyed, like nobody would trust me. Whatever it is, like worst case. Scenario, and usually that is the key. Whatever that thing is, how do you start to just? I call it off gassing because it really feels like just letting this energy substance that you're holding in、it、takes so much energy to hold in. How do we start to just let a little bit of it go slowly? It doesn't happen overnight necessarily. It can, but I recommend a more slow, integrated, and and sometimes it can mean sharing with someone you love and trust. Like, hey, I have this thing I'm aware of, and I'm aware of having repressed it for a long time. I'm really Embarrassed about it, and I feel like I need support to just tell somebody else a little bit about what I'm holding, so I don't have to hold this alone anymore. Yeah, it's so powerful when you share vulnerable experiences with other people and realizing that you're not alone. Because a lot of the time, I think shame is felt in silence, and that tends to take hold in our bodies. And I know something in your book that you tend to mention a lot is befriending your body. And so, if someone Was trying to identify where these repressed emotions were living. What would be a way for them to do that to identify these emotions or blocks? Yeah, it's a really good question. Thank you. Every body is so different. I have a whole chapter on this. Befriend the body because that's just that's one of the steps, right? It's like there's a step by step program or process I found that you can go through to really recover your true self and embody your authenticity. Part of which is really coming into the body, really being in contact with your body, which is really the vessel through which our intuition and our different multi dimensional abilities can orient through. And so the journey of moving out of the 
mind, into the heart, into the body, into feeling. And this is a unique process for every single person. Everyone will have a different way of doing that. I would say regarding your question, to start to become aware of emotional energy in the body and any energies that feel stuck or stagnant. Something I love to do is just almost every day, just shake, start a little bit in the morning, just shaking the body really gently. It's like we've been sleeping all night. Some people have really active dreams. There's a lot of energy processing. What are you doing first thing in the morning that helps you connect to your body? That's how you're going to start to feel a barometer of when your body is clear and energy is flowing and you're receptive and you're yourself and when there's something stuck you only start to see through kind of contrast and I find that especially at the beginning of this path of kind of emotional awareness and energetic awareness we got to get moving <laughs> we got to get moving in a mindful way so I like to just shake I set a timer for three minutes sometimes five minutes put on some music and just shake the body a little bit and imagine even like any stuck stuff is just shaking out and going into the Earth. Just like you'd shake an old rug and get the dust out or just really like that. And then afterwards, you'll already feel so much more clear and you may have a heightened awareness of like, hey, wait a minute. After shaking, I recommend like really sitting still or even laying down and then you can do a body scan and really start to see like, okay, interesting. Where does it feel like I notice a lot of energy flowing? I notice a lot of aliveness or like potential or where your breath just naturally goes. And is there anywhere that kind of feels a little bit stuck or stagnant or like energy flows a little bit lagging or it's hard to breathe all the way. I'm just becoming curious, not making anything wrong. Every day is also very different. Every day the body will be different and giving us different messages. But with this kind of practice done over time, you start to get really connected to like when you feel clear, when you feel like an open channel, when you feel like you're kind of light and receptive, and then you can really catch when something feels stuck or sticks, you know, is, is not moving and you can then develop your own process for working with that energy. Even sometimes as simple as just tapping where something feels a little bit stuck can get the energy moving, sending breath to that place. I like to ask part of the body if it feels stagnant, it's like, hey, what's happening there? Actually talking to the energy, talking to the organ, talking to that part of the body. What's going on? If you could talk, because it can, <laughs> how are we in conversation with this to learn? It has something to say. If there's pain or density or some kind of stuck energy, it wants to get our attention and we must listen and really ask. And then your body starts to communicate to you in all kinds of different ways through sensation. It might actually be like through a vocal conversation that you're imagining. And this is another way that I love to guide people in opening up their intuition. This is how we start to really entrain a more intuitive way of operating and communicating in the world. So I also know in your book, you tend to mention wounds and how they might manifest in the body. So what are some common things that you're seeing manifest in the body, whether it's an abandonment wound or whatever type of wound that you might see? Yeah, I go into some specifics of just kind of the most common ones I've seen as an energy healer and guide over the years. And then in my own body, I guess I'll speak to my own experience too, where gosh, I've just had the most health issues, if any. I've been very healthy, very fortunate to not have any like severe health issues. But the main thing that has been repetitive over the years has been issues with my root chakra and specifically glands. I talk about this in the book as well, glands that are on either side of my groin. That's been the only recurring health issue that I've ever really had. And I mean, years ago, when it first started happening, I would be so ashamed because there's so much shame around that part of my body, my sexuality, my like just as a woman, like the appearance of it. And it would just, I didn't know who I could talk to. I didn't know what was wrong. This is started happening when I was about 18 years old. And it was just, I had so much shame about it. And over the years, little did I know that this, this issue actually had everything to do with shame. <laughs> and I was feeling so much shame come up actually in response to what was the issue in the first First place, there was this repressed shame that I was carrying from being, I would say from a really young age, like really just energetic and curious and really sexual, but not in the way that our society hypersexualizes everything. You know, it's so normal and natural for little kids to, and for all of us to be curious about the body, to be curious about what feels good, to be just curious and it's innocent. There's no projection of sexualization and all of these things that we later are conditioned by society to believe about the 
the body and about sexuality. So like many people, when I was really young, I started exploring my body and then my parents might have caught me or seen me and then their energy was like, no, that's bad. Don't do that. Their own repression was projected on me. Their own shame was projected on me. And at a young age, I started to feel like the shame about my body's natural responses and guidance to do things that feel good. I talk about this again in other contexts in the book too, because I find this is really common. And so then I grow up and I start having relationships and having sex and there's all this shame and there's all this repression and frankly, disassociation from the body as well, like not wanting to be in the body because it feels so much, has had so much experience and it feels so much and I had no idea how to deal with any of that. So then my body manifests this health problem with this inflammation and this pain is trying to get my attention to feel this really repressed pattern of shame. And I even go many years, just take the thing out, just get Western medicine, just cut the thing out, you know, like <laughs> I didn't want to feel it. I didn't want to look at what was going on. I just wanted it to be done. And then it wasn't until I was ready years later where I'm like, what is actually going on here? And that problem had actually expanded to these other little cysts that were building up in that similar part of my body. And it really scared me. I was like, do I have cancer? Like, what is this? What's the problem? And I chose to do healers and trusted teachers that could really help me feel what was wanting to be expressed. And it ended up being a lot of shame and repression, repression of my power, repression of my creativity, and a lot of emotional energy, a lot of anger and grief. And yeah, and I had to really feel that. And I had the experience of these energetic cysts that I could have probably gone to the doctor and they would have said something else. You know, they would have said like, let's cut it out or surgery or whatever. But I had the experience of processing the emotions and the energy and the physical lump, many of them, little ones, went away, completely gone. And gone since then because I became aware of the emotional pattern and the really the psycho-spiritual pattern underneath that was creating the physical manifestation in the first place. And I haven't had it recur. That's amazing. So that's a pretty unique case, but I just, that same example, it applies to really any part of the body. I know this may be controversial. I even say that in my book. I'm like, some people might be like triggered by this. Like you're saying autoimmune disease is usually correlated to what? And I say that because I've worked with so many people that have had autoimmune disease and different expressions of autoimmune viruses or things that were the body's kind of attacking itself. And what I found working with those people in nearly every case is that it has to do with somebody really being in a very deep state of like self-hatred or escaping themselves, you know, not doing what it is they're really here to do, not letting themselves really see their unique purpose and what they're here to express and usually feeling very cut off from their inner child their inner world, their inner experience. So the body is getting their attention to really look within, to come home within, to really ask, wait a minute, why am I alive? What am I really here for? There's a greater purpose that's wanting to be expressed and acknowledged and more of a connection to one's true self. And I felt like it, it was important to speak into that. And I also can feel that that might be really triggering for a lot of people to, to consider that possibility. Yeah. All right. So we're going to pause here because I want to tell you about another program that has been life-changing in the podcast editing process. And that is Descript. Basically, you can import your video and Descript imports your video as a transcript which you can then edit as if it were a text document. So you can easily take out all the ums, delete entire text sections, which will then delete that section of the video. And they even have AI tools like Overdub, which can convert text to speech that sounds like you. I actually haven't used this, but I can see how it can be useful. It's pretty wild and a game changer. If you're interested in any form of content creation, especially a podcast, I'd highly recommend you check out my special link in the show notes and video description wherever you're viewing or listening to this podcast episode and see for yourself. With this link, you can access the script for free. Play around with it, see how efficient it is, and add Descript to your workflow to make your life easier. Now, back to the show. So when you're talking about your shame, I feel like there is this identification of I carried shame. You also mentioned that your parents projected shame. And so I'm wondering how much of that was your shame versus your parents' shame or intergenerational trauma that was passed down through that emotion of shame. 
Yeah, really great question. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's all of it. I mean, it's, at a certain point, we could say, yeah, a lot of that's inherited through my lineage and the many, many generations of people that didn't have the capacity to feel these energies. And it gets passed down the family until somebody can feel it and somebody can integrate it and complete the lesson. And I signed up for a lot of completion in this life. <laughs> As I know a lot of us alive on the planet have, we really did. We came in like, we're going to end these patterns. We're going to be free. We're going to do this deal. And it's hardcore. It's really, it's a lot. It's like many, many generations we're processing through our body. And it's almost like I want to hold a dual awareness. This is what I inherited by coming into this body through my DNA and my cellular memory, like from my biology. And... It's also mine. This is my body. This is my responsibility. So even if these energies came from someone else, it's here in my experience and I'm the one responsible for handling it. And how am I going to do that? You know, so it's, it's all of it. And at the end of the day, it, it's so complex sometimes too, because there's parts on the healing journey where it's been really important for me to really have safe permission and safe space to say, Hey, what happened was not fair. It was not right. It was not fair as a child to be born into a situation where I was not safe. And I was not taken care of in the way that I deserved to feel safe. That was not fair. And it took me a long time to realize like, wait a minute, that's a really important part of the healing process to acknowledge these parts of ourselves that are angry, that feel the injustice being born as a helpless little kid in these situations where we inherited all this stuff and it's really hard and it's not fair. And then the mature adult aspect of ourselves can come in and be with that wounded inner child, that part that is expressing some suffering that needs to be evoked needs to be let out and then our adult self can come in and say you know hey little one i know that really wasn't fair that was really hard but we got this. This is my responsibility as the adult. We orient to our inner child as like, hey, I got this. I'm responsible for this. I'm resourced. I'm doing what it takes to really alleviate these memories in the body that are causing the suffering to continue. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And this is really the essence of the journey like that I'm continually humbled by. Like in those moments when trauma gets triggered and a memory gets triggered in the inner child or this wounded aspect of ourselves when the trauma happened is trying to run the show and it's really upset sad or sad or angry or wanting to disassociate or escape is just running in a trauma memory of how inconsistent or unsafe or whatever, just right back in childhood. How available are we as that adult protector, our own inner parents to show up and really be with that part and really love him or her and really be there and really support and not let that little one take over our lives. And this is like kind of where I'm at in my process continually, just always guided back to that, strengthening that relationship within, strengthening that inner resource because no one else can do that for you. That is so true. It also sounds like your inner child manifested when you didn't have that strong relationship with your inner child, whether it was health issues or maybe relationships or things like that. Because you mentioned creating a safe space. I'm wondering how your adult self crafted and created that safe space for your inner child and what that looks like now. Oh, you ask great questions. I really appreciate you. Great insight. Thank you. Yeah, it's a gift. It's really a gift to be able to do that. So I just acknowledge you in that. And I can't do this alone. I've needed so much. I've gotten to call in a lot of support. I have a lot of complex trauma and it was really a lot to start feeling. I write about in my book, my first experience meeting my inner child. Oh my gosh, it was so shocking. I just had no idea. It's like unlocking a whole new house in your consciousness that you didn't even know was there the whole time, you know, and then breaking your own heart, realizing that I was abandoning this part of myself for my entire life. So that happened when I was like 25. I just had no idea. And there's so much emotion there and so much want that wanted to be said. And I could really only touch into that space when I felt the support of someone there as a healer holding space for me. Like in that case, it was an energy healing session and I was on the table and it was, I needed containment. And I still do when I touch into some of these really deep energies or new aspects of consciousness and the emotional body, I call in support. And I have a somatic therapist that I've been working with for years who's really helpful for that level of presence and attunement where I can just feel like, okay, I'm not going to get overwhelmed if I really let this energy come up. And then more and more just with myself, yeah, when you're doing this work with yourself, being in a really comfortable 
intentional space. Sometimes I'll be in my meditation area or even laying down on my own bed and just be really intentional about creating a safe, like calming. Sometimes I'll call it like create a healing chamber, just an energetic healing chamber. I'm in this golden field of light and I call in all my guides. I call in all my support. I call in all my higher dimensional aspects and just remember I have support. I'm not doing this alone. And then, you know, start to tune in. But also in this practice of developing that inner relationship, it for me it's been important to just make it a really consistent part of life and have it be like put a timer on your phone in certain cases, you know, and it's like remember to check in consistently because we can get on autopilot and busy in our day. And it's like set a timer on your phone for every hour, even if you want to start doing this practice. That reminds you no matter what to stop, hand on the heart, self-regulating, can even kind of do a little hug, self-regulating, like kind of compression on the body and the nervous system tune in can you feel your inner child can you connect just ask how are you how are you doing how are you being is there anything you need i'm here and we start empowering that relationship of the strong adult parent protector and then the little one can relax and feel tended to and feel seen and this can be especially challenging if you have a lot of abandonment patterning from having parents that weren't really available and it can even be hard at the beginning to know what you do need because there was never anybody around to really meet your needs so why even ask and as adults we learn okay what do i actually need and it can feel really strange at first just start to ask yourself that and sometimes feel, I have no idea what I need. I don't really know. But then we can ask, what would feel supportive right now? Really, really being curious. How can I help feel? How can I help you feel more calm, supported, comfortable? Just like we would parent a little kid who's just learning to understand what their needs are. And I really recommend, you know, guided meditations also, if you're new to this process, like just listening to, I have one on my YouTube, I have a bunch on my YouTube, like guided inner child healing meditation. That can feel really nice because you have the support of someone else there guiding you on a journey, guiding you through a process. It might be really scary or overwhelming if you're just tuning in for the first time, like, what's going on in there, you know? And I was thinking about that this morning. I used to actually, some of the first retreats I ever hosted were all about inner child healing. Remember who you are. It was the retreat. And I just feel like this is some of the most important work we could be doing right now for ourselves and really for the whole of humanity. Yeah. So something I like to do personally is let my inner child make decisions. So for example, if I'm choosing between vanilla and chocolate ice cream, I'll just tune into my inner child and I'll just hold it out to her and just ask, which one do you want? <laughs> and usually she'll pick one. And I feel like doing little things like that helps empower my inner child and also gives her a voice and a place in my life. So that's something if people want to try that. I love that. That's so much more fun. I'm, I'm like, you can go into the depths of the trauma by doing that. And you're like, actually, you can also just have it choose some ice cream. And that's really sweet. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> There is something to the depths of the soul, though, that I think creating that fortress of safety for the inner child to even want to come out, because I find that sometimes when I'm connecting to my inner child, she's scared. She's scared to come out because, you know, in different ways, I've experienced trauma as well. And so when connecting to my inner child, it can almost feel like she wants to be cared for. And in some ways, you don't know how. And I think sometimes it is helpful to reach out to someone else to craft that feeling of safety if that just doesn't feel like a normal thing for you because how can you feel something that just wasn't there for you in your own life so if you do need help don't be afraid to ask for it is all I'm saying <laughs> Oh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So do you lean into your community when you are going through these phases of healing? Have to. Yeah. And sometimes I'll have an enormous resistance because even with everything I've done and I can still feel shame sometimes around like needing help or the wounding of like, I don't know if anybody can really help me here. The part that just wants it to be done with and I don't want anybody to know and all kinds of things. And so I intentionally lean into that discomfort because I know the anecdote is connection. The an antidote is connection and support and being seen and just and showing up in my relationship as I am and being loved anyway, being loved unconditionally. And I show up for people that way. It's easier. It's always easier for me to show up in that way and service and support. And it's been edgy to let myself be supported, especially by friends. It's not like a therapist or someone I'm like in a professional container with. But the more I've let people in, the more I've, it's so healing, the more I'm like, wow, people really want to be let in. And it's an honor. It's an honor to support each other. 
in this way. It's actually so human. I wonder sometimes if my work has been like over-professionalized and it's like, wait a minute, like why are we even doing healing work in the first place? We're doing it because we love each other, because we love to support people and help each other heal and grow. And the giving is receiving, helping hold space for someone else. It's usually helping you, you know, heal some aspect of yourself. And so, yeah, that's been, I was in a, a motorcycle accident a month ago, all very interesting timing with everything, of course. And it was a so well, thank goodness you're okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, thank goodness I have so much angelic protection and support, but it was really this wake-up call to stop and feel a lot of things, actually, and also let go of this kind of distracting relationship that really wasn't very reciprocal. And that experience also was an initiation and, like, lean on community, be supported. I literally couldn't move for a week, so I, like, had to rely on people to come bring me things and be with me. And it was like a depth, a new depth of surrender and to being supported that I guess I really was calling in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And trust, it sounds like, too, that even though this accident happened, it feels like you uncovered your own lesson in it. And I mean, I suppose you're going through the process, but also a piece, right? That there's a higher plan. There's no accident is um, yeah. like literally no accident is. Um, there's no accident. It's all super designed. Yeah, it was all very, very clear immediately. I was like, oh, like right away as soon as the accident happened I was I saw just a life review of like why are we really alive why are we not everyone needs to go through this level not everyone needs to go through this intense of an initiation I feel like I was I'm living my purpose I'm doing my dharma but even still the universe was like stop it like get focused get refocused on what really matters what is most important why are you really here and stop distracting yourself in this relationship with this kind of unavailable person and just stop stop it get really clear on what actually matters. And in a way, like come more into the body, actually. It's like, whoa, I had to like come into a deeper humility of like these bodies, these sacred, really fragile bodies. We're absolutely nothing without them. And my, you know, my mind can be so overactive and imaginative and, and feel like it's driving the ship of reality. And I needed a wake up call to, to just remember like, wait a minute, no, this mind is really nothing without the body. This body is everything and we're going to come in even more. <laughs> Yeah. So I did want to ask you, what is your definition of ascension? And how do you know if you're ascending? <laughs> ascension to me is the experience of embodying one's true self at the cellular level. So spirit descending into form. It's kind of like a little play on words. Ascension historically has meant blasting out of the body into the higher realms and we're ascending off of this density back into spirit. And actually, to me, it means we're coming all the way down and all the way in, and we're going to fully inhabit these bodies as spiritual beings. And we're going to have the most expressive, just felt, full spectrum of feeling and experience life. You know, that's only possible through a body that has senses through which our consciousness can just create incredible, amazing things in this physical reality. And so I call it embodied ascension. And how do you know if you're on that path? You're alive on earth at this time. It's happening to all of us. We're all getting the same energy infused into the planet through solar waves and flares and other dimensional energy. And we're all being invited into more embodiment and awareness. And simply put, I would say we're all invited to awaken to more of our higher consciousness, to more of our truth to more of our true purpose for being alive? And how are we going to come more into the felt present moment experience of our reality through the body? Ooh, I love that. I love that definition, spirit descending into the body, because I do feel like when I think of ascending, it's all about like going beyond what is on my earthly plane. <laughs> but the whole thing is bringing that consciousness into our own awareness. And I know something you do mention in your book is this crisis of consciousness. And I was wondering if you could explain that a little bit more. Yeah. Well, I believe that we don't actually have any like crises on the planet that are not of our own making, that our inside world is creating the outside world. And science is now proving this more through like neurobiology and the quantum field. It's just becoming more 
commonplace knowledge that like our thoughts create things and the world around us generally. And so does our unconscious trauma and repressed emotional energy. It's creating everything outside in the world too, trying to get our attention to focus on what in us wants to be unwound and transmuted and alchemized. So what if every global crisis that we've been conditioned to see and believe in in the world is actually at some level some energy within me, I have a part in creating that if it exists in the world, what in me is wanting my attention? What in me, what unconscious emotional pattern, pain, trauma, wound is here within me, within my own body, within my consciousness, within the way I relate to reality that's being played out on this grand stage, just trying to get my attention. And that might be really triggering for people. They're going to be like, what about the starving kids in Africa? And what about rape victims and, and all these things? And I, not to minimize any of that. Yeah, that's part of our reality. Horrible things are happening in this world. Horrible, atrocious. And what I found to be most effective in dealing with that and being with it and choosing to exist in this planet is to say, yeah, and what am I going to do about it? Not just looking at, that's horrible, that's terrible, it's so sad. And yes, we have a grieving process and we can feel the injustice and all of it. And at the end of the day, if that's happening in my reality, somehow I'm a part of that existing in this world. So what in me is allowing that at some level? And I don't mean as this martyr, like it's all poor me, I'm creating this. It's a different lens on reality. It's a different lens on maturity and responsibility. Kind of a healthy observational way to say, hey, okay, if war is happening in the world and this is still happening, where am I at war with myself? Where am I like battling something within me that's not resolved? There's like some kind of disagreement or I'm not willing to like listen to myself or empathize with myself? Where am I at war with myself? If sexual abuse and these things are happening on the planet still and women are being oppressed and there's misogyny and so much hatred and violence, where am I not taking full care of my body? Where am I not respecting my body? Where am I not fully honoring my integrity with my body and what it wants? These are pretty big questions and I just found it to be the most useful for me because otherwise I'm in an existential crisis that just loops around of like, why am I on this planet still? And I don't really want to be here. Exactly. I feel like also this crisis of consciousness can speak to how I think a lot of people like to blame other people for whatever situations are going on and not take accountability for their part in it, whether it's in this life or another life or another part of their consciousness kind of projecting that back to them. And so something I'm hearing from you is that inner reflects outer. And if there are things going on in your external world that are triggering you, that can be something that you can take in to reflect on to ultimately better yourself. Because when we were talking about all these different aspects of our, ourselves, you know, our inner child, our adult selves, our higher selves. These are all relationships that we have within ourselves that ultimately you have yourself throughout the rest of your life because people can come in and out, but ultimately your inner child, your adult self and your higher self will always be there with you. So a lot of this, I think is just intake, right? And just gathering information, more of becoming more aware of who you are ultimately. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I know something you mentioned in your book as well. And by the way, if you haven't already gathered, there's so much wisdom in Sydney's book. So definitely go grab a coffee for yourself. But you do mention the multi-dimensional bodies. And I was just wondering if you could tell us more about what they are and how we can incorporate more of a relationship with that into our lives. Mm, I love that question. You could go into a lot of different portals with that question, but... Yeah, just to keep it simple, it's like we're not just our physical body, we're an energetic body, energy field, we're also within that field an emotional body, we're also, you could see like 16 layers of your spiritual body, so there's, depends how deep you want to go into that, but I just simplify it, mind, body, spirit, and then also like this notion of our soul, our soul being this essence that wants to embody through needs a place to land in our physical body. It wants to be here and really imbue. That's the embodied ascension, our spirit soul coming into form. And then we get in touch with my emotional body and my nervous system and my electrical body, my energy field. And we start to navigate reality in a different way through all these different lenses of perception and sensory information, ways of working with our intuition. And it's just part of the embodiment game, really. We become more integrated across all these different ways of orienting to reality. Yeah. 
What is presence and how do we become more present in our lives? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever defined presence. I love that, huh? <sighs> presence is a capacity to be with what is as yourself. I like that. Presence, presence is a capacity to be with what is as yourself. So in presence, we're out of time, we're out of space limitations, and we're just really inviting our full true self to land in the moment and be right here and grounded as we are in the body. And it's a capacity we develop. It's a skill. <laughs> it's a capacity that we can infinitely develop and expand into. That's part of my curiosity in this life. Like, what's it like to be such an unshakable foundation for presence? Just like, no matter what is going on, nothing can trigger me because I've cleared so many of the things in myself. It's just like... Whew, the craziest situation could be happening. And I'm so grounded in my presence. And from there, I'm able to make really clear decisions in response to reality instead of reacting from an unconscious wound or trauma. Yeah. And then I'm available for amazing relationships and real connection where I can really feel fully seen and just available for intimacy and love. And how can we use our emotions to become more present? Because I know we're talking about how our emotions can be a portal to feel our past situations or past memories, or maybe we even project fear out into the future. And so I'm wondering how you would use emotion to come back into our bodies and to just know that emotions are a passing moment of time. Mm. Emotions are designed to help us actually come into presence. You know, if we're feeling something, it's wanting our attention to process that so that we can be fully present. I wonder if we actually have emotional information moving if we're really present. It's just a curiosity arising right now. I'm like, hmm, I feel like emotions come through and come up to integrate, to feel, to process in the moment, to help us deepen into more presence. So we really through emotional maturity and emotional mastery, getting really aware of our patterns and just like, oh, I see that coming again. I know where that comes from and I know what to do when that happens and what I really need. It's just signaling. Emotional information is signaling me to usually take care of myself in a better way so that I can be more fully present and available. Yeah. So I'd love to wrap this conversation up with a few more questions. If you could give your younger self any advice, what would you say? I love you so much. You're doing so great. This isn't easy. You're going to have an incredible life. Keep going. I love you so much. No, I feel my heart expanding <laughs> when you're saying those words. What is your big three in astrology? Libra sun, Gemini moon, Pisces rising. Ooh, amazing. I have a Gemini rising and Pisces moon, so we share those. <laughs> and would you like a tarot reading? Yeah, I have a few moments. That sounds great. Okay, so I'm just going to shuffle the deck and I'm going to pull actually this card just popped on out. So you've got the strength card and are you familiar with tarot at all? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I know they're all different decks, so, but strength is like, that feels important for me right now. <laughs> yeah, this one literally just popped out as I was shuffling. And I always feel like that's a great indicator of spirit relinquishing this message to you. So strength is all about your inner endurance and courage and going through this phase of life where you're being very vulnerable and sharing your story in a mass published way. I feel like there's something to leaning more into that courageous side of yourself and letting yourself be seen. And the strength card is also associated with the sign Leo, which I feel like is always about activating that authentic side of yourself and having the courage to be seen as your authentic self. Because sometimes there can be fear around being judged or being criticized. But the more that you shine your light, the more other people will also be inspired to share theirs. And you're doing a great service by sharing these messages. So thank you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. So nice to be with you. And thank you for your really insightful, really considerate questions. It was such a pleasure. And yeah, thank you for all the work that you're doing in the world and the information you're sharing. And I can feel like you are impacting a lot of people's lives. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode with Sydney Campos. 
Sydney's experience sharing her ascension process with us can give us a lens for how we can view our own ascension process and perhaps, you know, not feel so alone because ascending or any type of spiritual experience can feel pretty isolating and lonely. So just know that you're not alone in this if you're going through this. And if you feel like you're about to go through this, you can always come back to this episode so that you have some guidance for your extension process. I'm so grateful to Sydney for sharing her wisdom and insight on how to befriend your body and working through trauma and difficult emotions that could be trapped inside the body, especially if we're not necessarily healing or dealing with it and then perhaps have a rude (laughs) awakening (laughs) ascension process so that we do deal with it. I loved this conversation with Sydney. And if you want to experience this special two and a half hour retreat with Sydney that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, which includes nervous system healing, instability, intuitive development, somatic attunement, presence practice, and soul embodiment. Here's how to access it. Leave a graced podcast review on Apple Podcasts. Screenshot your review and email it to graced at mysticmondays.com. That's G-R-A-C-E-D at mysticmondays.com. This two and a half hour retreat is usually an $88 paid experience, but Sydney has offered it for free just for graced podcast listeners. So if you want access, you know what to do. Also, as a reminder, we are doing a giveaway of Sydney's book, I'm Ascending, Now What? on Instagram. So make sure to head over to our Instagrams to check it out. As always, sending you so much grace today and every day. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. If you loved this episode, check out other Graced Podcast episodes where we talk more about how to apply everyday magic to your everyday life. See you next time.